Okay. So, how are you? How is it going? Fine? Yeah? Okay, so, I am Emanuele from Italy, and I would like to talk with you in this 45 minutes together about this topic, performing and thriving in the new era of ecosystems. And you will discover that it is all about overcoming ego. It's about letting go our egos. It's about not being egocentric. That's why, let's talk about me. This is me, last year, August 2018. I was in the middle of an important moment of my personal and professional growth. And my mentor, at a certain point, told me, Emanuele, you have to leave. Just choose where you want to go and go there for as many days you want. Say, okay, why, where? And he say, it doesn't matter, just go. Follow your instinct. Just bring with you one book. The book is Small Arcs of Larger Circles by Nora Bateson. And I decided to go in the Amazon forest. Why? I don't know. I just followed my instinct. And I went there. And while I was there in the Amazon forest, I was reading this book. And at a certain point, I flipped the page and I read. Where is the forest? Oh, come on. Where are the cameras? Is it a joke? Really, I was there in the Amazon forest, and in that book, Nora Bateson asked, where is the forest? Is it in the soil, insects, plants, animals, bacteria, or creeks? Where is the forest? We will arrive to answer to this question, but let's go in the topic. Let's talk about our organizations, and let's, step, let's go one step back in time. Don't worry, not so much. I'm not talking about the Egyptians. These slides remind me uh, to talk to you about our 20th century. And in the 20th century, we started to design our organization to be durable, to be stable, right exactly as the um, pyramids. And it reminds me also that when we start to design this kind of organization, we did it separating layers, who thinks and to who executes. It is something that started with the Cartesian revolution, you know, the René Descartes in the 17th century, Rex Cogitans, Rex Extensa, and this kind of stuff. But still, I don't want to talk about theory. It means that we started to design our organization in this way. That's it. This is what happened. And the most important thing on this slide is the date right here in the corner. 1917. We are at the beginning of the 20th century, and this kind of, of organization worked very well. They worked very well. And at the beginning of this century, we have, for example, Taylor had his scientific management studies, 1910. We have Gantt with the Gantt chart, 1910. We have the first MBA at Harvard, 1920. It is the beginning of the management as we know it today. But why this kind of organization worked very well in the 20th century? Because of this. This is, is called the Taylor bathtub. You can see the shape of the bathtub. And it, mean, it shows how, it, at the beginning of the 20th century, the complexity of our market and our society just went down drastically. The complexity went completely down we started to have the possibility to predict what would have happened in the next 10 or 20 years. And so those kind of organizations that were stable, predictable, durable, worked very well. But at a certain point, the complexity of our market and society started to rise up again at the end of the 20th century. This is because of a lot of a lot of reasons like uh, the new technologies, society and economic and political changes and so on. But still, we now are living in a new era of complexity. Interesting enough is that the 20th century, this kind of level of complexity is so low 
it has been a singularity in the human history. For millions of years of human history, people lived in a complex world, in an unpredictable world. So it, it, it was a strange period in which our, we, maybe some of us, or at least our parents, born and lived, and we just thought it was normal, but it was not. It was a singularity. We never lived in a, in, in a period of such predictability. Now, last thing about this slide, then, of course, if you want, we can deep dive in any of, of the things that I will present, but I will go fast. The important thing of this slide is this left part. When the complexity is low, the dynamics are low, we can rely on machine, algorithms, standard procedures, and so on. But when the complexity is high, we have to rely again on people. Why? Because we lived for millions of years in complexity. We have it in our DNA. We have to rely again on the capacity of people to cope with complexity. Now, people. I have a psychological background, and uh, it seems that in the last couple of decades, the concept of passion is at the center of what we called uh, whatever is related with human resources. I hate this, this concept of resources, but still, this is how we call it still. So passion, we have to find passionate people. We have to create passion in our organizations, in our people. That's true, but working with organizations, I understood that passion alone is not enough. Nothing changed with passion alone. So I started to observe in the last couple of years what we need with passion to help our people to use their knowledge to, to cope with this complexity. First thing, talent. We have to develop talent. And there is one concept at the intersection between passion and talent. It is a concept uh, studied by Sir Ken Robinson, and it's the concept of the element. Sir Ken Robinson says that the element is the meeting point between natural aptitude and personal passion. When people are in their element, they connect with something fundamental to their sense of identity, purpose, and well-being. Now, there is a category of people in our world that is always connected with their element. There is always in this connection between passion and talent. Any clue who they are? Sorry? Spokesman? Maybe? Yeah? Other ideas? No? Children. They are always connected with their element. Have you ever seen ch like five years old children playing football or crickets very well and you say, oh, come on, you are five years old. How is it possible that you are so good in it? Because they just do what they like. They follow their passion. And following their passion, they develop their talents. And doing so, they start to be in their element day after day. And there is one reason, because children are able to stay in their element. Because when they are very young, kids aren't particularly worried about being wrong. They just don't care. They break their legs. They arrive home completely dirty. It doesn't matter. They just don't have fear. So it's very important to remove fear from our organization and help our people to develop their talent and follow their passion. But still, this is not enough. I found that there is another thing that we have to develop related to passion, and is responsibility. At the intersection between passion and responsibility, I want to show you another concept from another author that I like much, very, very much. That is um, Arizon Owen, the same creator of the open space technology that maybe some of you knows. And it's the concept of wave riders. Wave riders are curious people constantly seizing upon opportunity when others see no possibility or even disaster. Their level of performance is consistently high, but they are never alone. Wave riders bring a special gift, leadership. Their passion and responsibility together for a cause inspire others to make common cause, 
not by domination and control, but through invitation and appreciation, the efforts of many coalesce as one. Leadership is not something positional. It doesn't matter where you are in your org chart. Leadership is something that manifests at the interception of your passion and your responsibility. Just a couple of examples. Sir, Ken, um, uh, Sir Richard Branson and Mahatma Gandhi, one in business, the other one in politics and society, they are or were passionate, but they took responsibility for their passion. Those things made them leaders. But you don't have to find people to change the world. Each person in your organization can be a leader. You have just to be sure that they can follow their passion and they can take real responsibility. So passion and talent, passion and responsibility. I was in the, in the middle of this discovery when I observed something in the organizations I work with that when it happened, it made the difference. But I didn't, find, uh, didn't find any concept able to explain what I observed. So I just invented a word, egoism, egoism. I invented this word because I really, I didn't find what I wanted to, to, to say. And I defined egoism in this way. Egoism means deliberately acting for the advantage of the ecosystems in which we live, not just for a personal benefit or an altruistic aim, but because of a deep understanding of being at the same time an individual and the system itself. Now, here comes the hard part of it. I'm not saying that you are part of a system. I'm saying that you are the system. Now, how I arrived to this concept, starting from the duality between egoism and altruism. Egoism is when I do something for myself, for my benefit. Altruism is, is when I do something for some other, for another part of the system. But what if I don't see any more this distinction between me and you? There are no more parts. We are just the same thing. Egoism. And if you think this is something theoretical, something too much utopic, think about a family. A mother doesn't act for egoism or for altruism. She doesn't act because of the benefit of one of her children. She acts because she feels to be the family. And doing so, she acts egoistically. These people who are cleaning the street of their city, they are not doing it because of their personal benefit. They are not paid for that. And they are not doing it because of the people that live here in this door. They are doing it because they feel to be the city. They represent the city in that moment. Egoism. Our team can do the same. Now, passion, talent, and responsibility, and egoism. I think this is quite enough to really have some changing moments in our organizations. Last thing about this slide is the symbol that I used. Talent is something related to yourself. It's a spot. It's me. It's my talent. Responsibility is something that is me in relationship with others. You see the filled spot and the empty spot is like other people. I can see this difference. But when I am in egoism, I don't see any difference between me and the others. Now, all this is not possible in an organization like this one. No way. Too many uh, cages, okay? Your people will not be able to follow their passion, develop their talent, be responsible for the action, and uh, become real leaders in such an organization. They will not be egoist in this kind of organization. Why don't we start to see this kind of organization? It's pretty similar to the slide that this morning Dr. Kirkpatrick showed about Morningstar. And I, I never saw his presentation before, so I was quite surprised and happy about this similarity. Our organizations are made of many, many people. Well, if you are a startup with small people or you are a multinational with 1,000 people, it doesn't matter. What matters is that each of these points is one person, and each lane, each line is a relationship. It is a complex word, okay? But let's move one step up. What if I see my 
organization as a spot and other organizations are other spots. So I see it ecosystemically. My organization connected to the whole world. This is not something that you have to build or to, or to map. This is the reality. The world works in this way. You have just to recognize it. And for the first time, this interconnection is global. This is, what, this is the difference between before the 20th century, where the complexity were, was high, but it was local. It was a local complexity. And this complexity in which we live, it is a global one. For the first time in human history, a problem can arise in the United States, be studied in Asia, and be solved in Africa in three weeks. It never happened before. We have a power that is incredible. Now, to summarize what I said until now, and then we will move forward. This is Donella Meadows wrote this beautiful sentence in this article that uh, it's, it's very interesting. If you, you, if, if you want to read it, all the article is very interesting. I will give you the slides so you can read it. And she says, systems can't be controlled. We can search forward with certainty into a world of no surprises, but we can expect surprises and learn from them and even profit from them. We can listen to what the system tells us and discover how its properties and our values can work together to bring forth something much better than could have ever been produced by our will alone. That's what I mean with overcoming egoism. It's about embracing what the system is telling us. But now, I don't want to be, again, too much ther mm, theoretical, and I want to play with you. I want to play with you with this concept of narratives. It is something at the interface between ego and eco. A narrative is something that allows us to be in this ecosystem with much more awareness. So let's play a little bit. But before to play, what does, I, what does it mean, a narrative? A narrative is a flow of stories. It doesn't belong to anyone but it exists in different contexts and everybody can take part of a narrative with their contents and stories. So a narrative belongs to all the people who participate in that flow. And through the contribution of people, the narrative can evolve and change not having an end. People die for a narrative. It's a flow of stories that doesn't belong to anyone, but belong to all the people that join that flow of stories. Just a couple of examples, a gel at scale. This is a narrative. It doesn't belong to anyone, but each person that with his content, his thoughts, his feelings participate in that narrative, uh, nurture the narrative and become part of it. Gender equality at work. This is another narrative that is widespread in the world and we can participate or not to this narrative, but it exists. It doesn't belong to anyone. It is just there. Climate change is another narrative. Now, let's play a little bit. I ask you to work in pairs, in couples. You should have uh, small post-it uh, notes, some small sticky notes. So I ask in couple to think about some narratives. What are the narratives that we are living in our time, in our world? And just write them down, okay? Uh, I think that a good number is six to 10 narratives for each couple of people. So just find a partner and write down all the narratives that come in your mind. Six to 10 is enough. Uh, two minutes, no more than that. Just a quick round of brainstorming. Don't worry about being right. Just write whatever comes in your mind. Uh, you want to cheat. Yes. This is the definition of narrative. Mm -hmm. 
One more minute. Okay, how many do you have? Five? Six? Okay, for those payer that doesn't have at least six, please steal some from here. <laughs> it's just, uh, well, this is important to say. What we are doing is something that we usually do with our customer in workshop that is about four hours. We are doing the whole thing in 10 minutes. So. Of course, you will not be able to find the perfect narratives and the perfect solution. So just bring some of here and be sure to have at least six. Let's say six to 10 maximum. And well, well just some example here. Agile at scale, gender equality, artificial intelligence, smart working, blockchain, biomimicry, happiness at work, work-life integration, people at the center. Well, also work-life integration was mentioned to Doug Kirkpatrick this morning. Could he have seen my presentation? <laughs> no, I'm joking. Okay. Now, in pairs, again, with the same partner that you have, please take one A4 sheet of paper and write this and draw this, this arrow with the label life phase. We should have enough. If you don't find sheets, uh, just ask. So just draw this arrow at the bottom of the, of the page with the label life fades. And what we are going to do is something like this. We are going to order our narratives, the narrative that you wrote, from the newest one to the oldest one. What does it mean? A new narrative is a narrative that is in the world since maybe a few months, a few years, is very new. An old one is something that is in the world from years, from decades, from centuries, okay? So just order your narrative from the newest, the new, the newest one on the left to the oldest one on the right. How do you feel? It doesn't have to be mathematical. Also in this case, two minutes. You have it? Great. Just some seconds to finish. Are you ready? Yes or no? Yes. It seems everybody's ready. Okay, now just write down the number in the corner of the small post-it. So from the one to the N, I don't know how many you have. So just one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. Just to remind which is the order, because now we are going to put them out of the paper. So just write down the small number in the, at the corner of the post-its. It should be quick and simple. If it is not, I ex 
the newest is the number one, the oldest is the number n. So, okay. Now, we have done it this in couple just to have some conversation about the life phase, but now we will work individually because it's important to have your own point of view on those narratives. So just make a copy and be sure that each one has the exact copy of the partner with the numbers at the corner. Okay, I will give you one minute to do this copy. Again, it should be quick. Just make a copy. So to have the exact copy of your partner. Okay, now each of you should have something like this. So you should have a copy also the, the paper. So each of you should have a deck of sticky notes and uh, A4 with life phases, with life phase draw at the bottom. And now the last step in this exercise. I ask each of you to add a dimension, to add another act. It is identity resonance. So this is about yourself. This is why this last step is made individually. Because it's how much those narratives resonate with you. How much you feel those narratives close to you. How much do you feel that those narratives is something that is very close to what you do, what you are, and so on. And when I say you, you can do this exercise thinking about you as an individual like me. For me, for Emanuele, how much these narratives resonating? Or you can think about your company. Just choose. So for my company, there is Kukum Projects. How much this, this, resonant, this uh, narrative resonates? Just choose if you adopt your own point of view individually or the one of your company. And again, order it from the uh, more resonating one. So the one that you say, yes, this is my narrative. This is something I want to really contribute in. And then down, 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 down until the last one. You say, this is something that I recognize is in the world but I don't care so much, okay? Just order it, how much it resonates with you. One minute to do it, and this is the last step of this exercise. Then I will, uh, I will explain you why we are doing it. I already see some people ready. Okay. Okay, just some seconds to finish. And you should have something like this. Your post-its with the numbers actually not in order. Well, it can happen that they are in order, but it's just a, a strange situation that it can happen, but usually the numbers are not ordered anymore. What I ask you to do is to move the post-its according to the numbers. For example, the number one is okay, it's in the first lane. Number two, just go a little bit on the, on the right. Number three, a little bit more. Number four, a little bit more, and at the end, you should have something like this. So move your posting according to the number, from left to right. The higher is the number, the more it goes to the right. Okay, so this is something that you can bring home with you. We, you can reflect upon it. And now 
I will explain you how to reflect upon this thing. Just to let you know, this is something that, as I mentioned, we work with our client, and we can go very deep. For example, you can see arrow between the narratives. It means which narrative nurture other narratives. So we really go deep in exploring this, this stuff, usually something that we do in hours, not in minutes, for sure. And this is just some example of two customers we work with. But then, what is a narrative? Narrative is something that it is at the intersection between you and the ecosystem. You cannot map an ecosystem. When you read something that mentions mapping ecosystem is something that is not true. You cannot map it. It's too complex and it's too unpredictable. But what you can do is to work with this system. As Donella Miso uh, wrote, I, I read the, the, the quotes before, you can work the, with this system. You can understand how to dance with this system. And the narratives are a door that allow you to connect with the ecosystem. If you are in a narrative, you participate in a flow of stories, of contents, with the whole ecosystem that is participating to that narrative. So understanding which are the right narratives in which to be is very important. But this is just a small part of an entire framework that allows you to work with an ecosystem. And curiously enough, at the beginning of this talk, I said that it was all about overcoming ego. I lied. You cannot overcome ego. Everything starts with your identity. That is at the center, always. Who you are makes the difference. You cannot forget it. You cannot forget who you are. You cannot avoid who you are. And curiously enough, again, is that while you work on your identity, you can move to the external parts of this framework. And for example, your work, your strengths, your relationships, the creation spaces in which you are, and so on. Allow, the more you go to the external parts, the more you participate in the ecosystem life. And once you arrive at the intersection, like in this case with the narratives, those narratives allow you to evolve your, your identity and you start again. So your identity evolve with your ecosystem. Ecoism, okay? There are no parts. While you are in an ecosystem, you evolve as as an individual, as a company, as whatever it is, your identity evolves. Last thing about this framework that we are developing and we are working with our customers is that it allows us to rethink completely the concept of sustainability. Usually the sustainability is the sustainability of the organization. Is my organization sustainable? But this is just a part. You can see here me up and me down. This is something like you can find it in the business model canvas, for example, no? The costs and the revenues, what allow me to, um, to grow and what blocks me and so on. But then you can find here we up and we down. What is something that let the ecosystem grow? And what block the power of the ecosystem in which we are? In this framework, you have both parts because ego is important. But eco now is very much, um, well, you, you cannot just don't see it. Because we are in a period in which this is something that you cannot avoid it anymore. And so I'm here in the Amazon forest with my book with this question. Where is the forest? Is it in the soil, insects, plants, animals, bacteria, or creeks? The forest exists in the relationships between all of those living things. The forest doesn't exist in any of these things alone. Your organization don't exist alone. They exist because they are part of an ecosystem. And this forest is something that is already sprouting all around the world. And this concept of growing, of flourishing, you cannot avoid them anymore. The only question that I ask you, and, I'm, and with this question I will close my talk, is in this global complexity of interconnection 
of interdependency, of interbeing. Where do you want to be tomorrow? Thank you. Uh, I think we have some time for question if there is any. Is it correct? I don't know if you have a question. I'm here for five minutes, more or less. Nope. Yes. Well, I sorry. Hi. Hi. Um, good concepts. I understand that. Uh, what I want to understand is how do you practically kind of go go about implementing these things, right? I understand the concept level, the theory, everything, right? Implementation at the ground level is what I'm not able to put my head around it. So how do you go about doing any suggestion in that front? Yes. So the question is, um, it is interesting as a concept, but how I can implement it concretely in my work? And actually, this is just one, one answer. We developed this. You can see it is a canvas, but it's not about the canvas. It's about the, the methodology that is behind that is much more complex. We are now working concretely with organizations, trying to understand what is the difference between acting egoistically with the organization and act egoistically. And we are finding that this framework is helping us a lot. So this is a starting point. We are writing about it. Actually, in Kukum Project, what we usually do is do, and just after we have done, we write something. We never write manuals or how to do stuff up front. Now we are starting to write things because we are applied it and we are discovering things. So this is a starting point. But also the, the um, picture that I presented at the beginning of the talk is important because it's something that you can do it. How many slides I used? Come on. This one. Because this is something that you start using with your organization nowadays. So how to develop talent, how to allow real responsibility, and it you can imagine it like, um, like an arrow that go from here to here to here. So this is the first step that you can use. But then that framework, we are seeing that is very powerful. And I have to say, it's not for everybody. It's not for all the organization. It's only for those organization that really want to make this step forward. Otherwise, if you push it, it will never work. That's something that I have to, be say, that I have to say, because otherwise I will not be honest. But if, if you think that your organization is ready to have this, to embrace this concept, we can do it uh, together or we can just have an hangout chat or whatever it is to, to help in, in this transition. So these two things are two leverage points that you can use. the fact that you are part of the ecosystem and ecosystem should accept the fact that you are part of it. Yes. I think your answer to the previous question actually answered my question as well. But yes, uh, but thank you very much for highlighting these uh, shades because it allows me today that even in this case, when I talk about people, so the, um, the framework that you uh, have seen is about something that you can use with the entire organization. But you can use it also for yourself just to understand how you relate to the ecosystem. But in this case, I talked about people, so about individuals. And what I have to say is that for sure for the ecoism, but it's also true for the other two, if your organization or your ecosystem doesn't allow you to, to do that stuff, you will not be able to do it. So you cannot act egoistically if your organization doesn't allow you to act egoistically. And in the case of the ecosystem, you cannot act egoistically if the ecosystem doesn't allow you to act egoistically. So it is a mutual relationship. That's the beauty of this, of this thinking, I, I, I think, because it's no more, un, uh, how can I say, one direction only, but it's always bidirectional, always. Otherwise, it doesn't work. Yes, so thank you very much for this question. Okay, so thank you. Uh, I will be here around for a couple of hours, and you can reach me online whenever you want. So thank you for being here and exploring this topic with me. Thank you very much.